basically what these drugs are doing is saying, okay, instead of having 300 fat cells, just as an example, now we're going to expand those fat cells up to 500 fat cells. Now all those other ones aren't full, so you can start putting more in over there. So you drop the insulin level down because those new fat cells aren't blown up to the max where it's hard to shove it in. And so that is the conundrum is once you go off the medicine, now you have a lot more fat cells to fill up. And, you know, they say if you build it, they will come. Hey, what's up, family? I'm Rachel. And I'm Joe. And we are Two Two Crazy Crazy Ketos. Ketos. And if you're new to our channel, welcome. Here on Two Crazy Ketos, we do different things like recipe videos and we do product reviews. We talk about various keto topics. And every Monday, we go live on Keto Beyond the Couch because life exists beyond the couch. You can find us in different social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a website, which is twocrazyketos.com. And that's where we're going to find all of our different recipes. Now we do upload at least five new videos every single week. So make sure you subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the little bell icon. And that way, every single time we upload a new video, you'll be alerted to it. I am super excited for today's podcast. I am too. I've been excited for like the last month. As soon as we got into the car in a snowstorm and was going to the airport, knowing that we were going to get to have Dr. Lemskis on our podcast. Like, I've been excited since that moment. So a little background. We met Dr. Brian Lemskis last year at the um, Utah Summit, and we were really excited about him, and we got to spend a little bit of time talking to him. And then this past February, we were in Utah, and uh, he joined us at a meetup for Keto Chow, and we had some amazing conversations about glucose and gut biome and um, stopping that stall. And so I'm really excited to have him on today's podcast. So let's jump right into it. How hey, you doing, thank Dr. you. Lenskis? Thanks for the invite. It's so great to see you both. When I was listening to you talk, when we were giving our talk together, it was amazing because I, I felt like I was on uh, Shark Tank. Because you two are so good. You're so like, I'm like, how do they do it with two people? Tro and I were going to try to give a talk together and it was going to be way too challenging. So it's amazing. It's amazing how, how you two, it's almost like you're married or something, huh? Right. Yeah, right. Well, you know, one of the things <laughs> is, is we're passionate about what we do. Yeah. And I know that you're passionate about what you do as well. And and the thing is, is, you know, when we introduce each one of our videos, we talk about something, you know, we say every Monday we do our keto beyond the couch because life exists beyond a couch. And I think when you regain your health and all of a sudden you know, you're able to do things you were never able to do before. You want to scream it from the rooftops. You just want to tell everybody, hey, I found this amazing thing and I need you to know about it. It's kind of like when you become a Christian, right? You just want to tell everybody about Jesus. Yeah, it's so true. And we were so excited to get to meet you because your your joy and your enthusiasm and your desire to help people, it really shines through in every interaction. And I mean, you can hear it in your podcast, like whenever you're speaking, you you know, you can just tell that you're very passionate about helping people. And I wonder, how did you decide to even become a doctor? Yeah, you know, that that's kind of a funny story. It was just, I I never really thought about it. When I was growing up, I never thought I'll be a doctor. No one in my family's ever been a doctor. It's not in my bloodlines. So I was in an undergrad and my buddy who is he's he subsequently became a dentist he said hey and I was going to do physical therapy I was going to do something in health related because I like helping people but I wasn't sure what I was going to do and he said hey there's this thing called flying Samaritans we, they go down to Mexico and they do free clinics down there would you be interested in doing it? I was like yeah I don't think I want to hang out with doctors but I'll, I'll go down and see what it's like and we went down and these guys were they happened to be from USC where I ended up going and they were so compassionate, so kind. They're med students and residents and, you know, newly graduated doctors. And, you know, I just saw them helping people and being kind and compassionate and and loving what they did. And I thought, man, this would be cool. So I said, hey, what do I have to do to be a doctor? And then it kind of just snowballed from there. From there. And how long have you been a doctor to this date? Gosh, you're going to date me huh? Uh, about 20 years now. I've been That's in practice. Amazing. So I graduated from med school in 1999. That is impossible because he's only 25 years old, Joe. So like that was got to be the youngest person that's ever graduated from med school. So congratulations on that, sir. Not Doogie Hauser. We were in the same class. (laughs) I love it. Now, I bet you've seen a lot of changes over that amount of time. 
what are some of the the things that that changed for you that that really stood out uh, during this time a, as a doctor? I think the biggest change. I mean, I've, I I think we all got educated a lot on the system over the last several years, but you know, I started realizing we were just throwing pills at everything. It just seemed like that the visits. As I was, you know, I was in a standard model for about 18 years, the last two doing doing uh, direct primary care, which is outside the, the standard insurance model. But I started realizing, I started seeing that the reimbursements were going down and down and down every year. While the insurance were charging more and more and more for the patients every year, I said, where's this extra money going? Why are we not seeing it? And why is it that I'm having to, you know, it says spending half an hour with the patient, now it's 20 minutes, now the next year it's 15 minutes, now it's eight minutes, and you see these changes. And you think this isn't good for anyone. It's, not, it's definitely not good for the doctor because they're all burned out and stressed out and working tons of hours, at which I was doing 18-hour days a lot of days. And uh, and it's not good for the patients because they're rushed through. Or if they're not rushed through, then they have to wait forever to get in to see the doctor. And I thought, this system, there's something wrong. you know. And I saw that the, us primary care guys weren't the ones making the money or or uh, you know costing the system a lot. It was really more the specialized care, the MRIs and the CAT scans and the surgeries and the dialysis. And so that, that's when I started really thinking, gosh, we talk about preventive medicine, but what can you prevent in eight minutes with a patient? You can't. You can only prevent them from getting healthier, probably. You know, it's funny. I, I know we talked a little bit about it when we were in Utah, but um, I come from a medical family. My father was a clinical chemist. He ran the laboratories um, for the hospitals that do all the blood work. And my mother uh, was an oncologist, and she retired when when COVID hit, but You know, she graduated medical school in 1967, and I know she had talked about for years just watching the way the insurance companies were taking over more and more and more and determining, you know, the way she had to practice medicine. And I remember growing up, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s and the 80s, you know, her patients were all elderly. They were all in their 60s. You know, she that that's who got cancer back then. It was rare that you saw a 30 year old with cancer like we see now. But you know, she had a small private practice and she had office hours two days a week and she would spend an hour and a half with a patient as a new consult. Like, you know, she's like, we're dealing with something serious here. You know, they've got cancer. You're giving them, you know, possibly a death sentence. And, you know, she watched over time where the insurance companies started going, no, you can spend 15 minutes with the patient. You could spend 20 minutes with the patient. Oh, that um, chemotherapy drug that you're giving to the patient, Uh, We're only going to pay you $30 for it, even though it's costing you $70 out of your pocket. And it really affected the way she had to practice oncology to the point where she had to close her practice and just start working for a hospital. And and it's a shame because I think that in the end, patients don't get the care that they really need. What do you see that you've been able to accomplish now that you have, uh, you know, shifted to that direct care model? So much more, you know, my patients are looking at their watch like, doc, I got to go. I got a meeting. You know, I, it's the other way around now when I love it because, you know, sometimes they, they have to leave or they'll say, hey, you know, and, and if someone's, you know, if you're if you have an eight minute appointment, and you're running 10 minutes late. It's a total disaster for the rest of the day, especially when it's going to stack up with everyone else. And they're upset that they have to wait for you and all this. So now it's like if someone's 15 minutes late for an appointment, they go, OK, I'll just see you for 40 minutes instead of an hour. Right. So it's not that big of a deal. So it doesn't it doesn't jeopardize all my other patients because for me i didn't mind if someone was late really but i had nowhere to put them plus if they miss their appointment i'm booked out for the last six months now it's like hey do you want me to see you on tuesday or thursday and so we, we have access so the patient can contact me like all the time today just before we went on i had three people text me go hey doc can you refill my meds yeah okay no problem send in done so before it would be five people in the process it would someone would answer the phone then it would send to the voicemail then someone else gets the voicemail writes it down on paper then puts it in the computer that's it, 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 the the inefficiencies of medicine are insane plus you know the whole point of of documentation takes a lot of time too so it's not just like you finish seeing patients you go home for the day so you know a lot has changed dramatically first of all i'm happier and i'm easier to get along with and i'm not in a rush all the time because when you when you're thinking oh if i get behind then I, I, you know i'm going to you know my my biggest frustration was i would get knocked on the door all the time and trying to help someone who's going to get diabetes and i can help them prevent it but they're like, doctor, you have three people waiting. You have to hurry. That's really mm-hmm. stressful because you want to help that person. So mm-hmm. one of the great things about my practice now, and it's crazy how life is, because I remember sitting with my wife one day saying, you know, it'd be so awesome because I'm saying the same thing all day, right? This low carb keto stuff. I'm saying it all day, but why can't I just say it one time and everyone gets that? Wouldn't that be great? So what we do now is once every two weeks, like last night we had a group meeting and we just 
talk about everything. You know, I can have 30, 50 people at one time and it's my one hour still, but we could all talk about say, hey, who's struggling with, who's struggling with eating cookies at night? Who's struggling with depression right now? Who's, and people will, will share or ask questions. And then you have people that you're with, you know, you know, like Joe, I was thinking about when you were telling me about your mom having one IV pole and everyone's mm-hmm. getting chemo in a circle, that community of saying, I'm not the only one going through this. And I could talk to someone else about life and what matters and all these things that there's huge medicine in that. You know, so when you were saying that, I, it gave me goosebumps because I think, gosh, so many of us are struggling and we realize someone else is not eating cookies tonight, too. Then, you, 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 you know, and it's not easy for them either. So I think when we build community and we can reach a lot of people at one time and, you know, that was my big epiphany was when I had people that weren't even that I never even saw as a patient said, hey, thank you for helping me. And I was like, I never met you before. And they said, well, I listened to the podcast, this episode, this patient really spoke to me, you know, and then someone else may speak to a different person. So, you know, it's so great that we can reach so many people like what you're doing. For Matt, I could just send patients, you know, say, hey, look at this episode. And, and it's great that we could all kind of, you know, give a, a united message and maybe have different takes on certain things. And that's OK. But mm-hmm. just to really give people support, because some people may say, hey, I like making chaffles. I don't like omelets or I like this. So to give people a, a different flavor, <laughs> literally, but, you know, to see there's different ways to do it. You don't just have to eat hamburger every day of your life and you're never going to eat anything else, you know. So I think it's really important that we all, you know, we all work together and do our part. And then, you know, people can just do that much better. So let's back up a little bit, because obviously, you know, you've been in medicine for 20 years. You were not keto for 20 years. Um, So I want to back up for a minute. How did you even discover a ketogenic way of eating? Like what was life like before that? And what made you decide like, hey, I need to to try something different? Yeah, because uh, we hear a lot from people in the medical community that actually people that work in hospitals, doctors, nurses sometimes have the worst diet because of their particular schedule. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I think you know, as a kid, I was overweight. My whole family, everything was, if someone died, you had food. If you were sad, you had food. If you're happy, you celebrate with food. So everything was kind of like that, you know? And so all my uncles and aunts on my mom's side died in their fifties for the most part. So they just said party and live your life and die young. And that's the way it is. I'm like, man, I think I'm predisposed to this. And then I played football and wrestled in high school. So I might, I, I controlled my weight that way. But then once I got out of high school, you know, college, you're, you get the freshman 15 or 30 or whatever it might be. You're under stress. And what do you do? You say, oh, let's take a study break and let's get a pizza. And so you start associating those things with relaxation, you know, the the Saturday morning cartoons when you didn't have life stress and all that. And then uh, med school, residency, you're sleep deprived, you're stressed, you know. So in residency, we trained ourselves just to eat whenever you can because you you don't know if you're going to have a break for five hours or it's going to be next hour. So if they got we got a break in an hour, it's like, oh, we better eat again just in case we we can't do it again, you know. But then the next day after being up all night and stressed, you're starving all day. So you're right. In the hospital, it's probably the worst food in the world. It, you know, it's all bagels, donuts, uh, cereal, orange juice, you know, everything like that. That's very quick that you could just grab and throw in your pocket. Over time, I started gaining weight and I'm thinking, gosh, and I was following the, the ADA's recommended diabetic diet. So I'm like, I'm just going to eat, you know, my green shake in the morning. Then I'm going to have, a, you know, some uh, a healthy sandwich on healthy whole wheat toast with some nonfat pretzels and you know, a cliff bar or something like that. And okay, if I'm busy, I'm going to do it. So you start realizing it all adds up over time. You think, oh, juicing has got to be healthy. You're pouring a bunch of fresh orange juice like that you just squeezed yourself, but you don't realize you're, you're taking all the pulp and all the good stuff out of it and you're putting just pure sugar in your body. So I got really insulin resistant. So one of my patients uh, came in one day and he had lost 40 pounds. I said, what the heck did you do? And I, first thing I thought was he has cancer or diabetes because that's the only time you see weight loss in, in the Western world. And he said, ah, you're not going to like it. He said, I'm doing this thing called the fast diet. And I said, ah, that doesn't make sense. What do you do? And he goes, oh, I fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I have mostly, um, you know, no carbs. I cut out my carbs. And I have 500 calories or less Tuesday and Thursday. And I said, okay, what about the other days? He said, well, I eat whatever I want. And I said, well, you're eating pizza and drinking beer and all that. And he said, yeah. So it doesn't make sense. So if you're fasting on Tuesday, you must eat twice as much on Wednesday to make up for it because you're starving. He said, no, that's the weird thing. I can't figure this out, but I'm not hungry at all the other days. I said, well, that doesn't make sense, does it? So I started Googling this and thinking, how can this fast diet? Because there's no such thing as a fast diet. And so I started Googling who do I come up with. Jason Fung is being interviewed by Metabolic Mike. And I'm like, I remember sitting there le- leaning back in my chair watching this on YouTube thinking, if these guys are right, I'm going to be so mad because I had Melba toast and I had, you know, 
factors and you know all these things that you think are really helpful for you that are torture you know like that we all did the grapefruit diet and the, the the you know the cabbage diet and all this stuff that everyone photocopied and passed around and all this stuff but it works for a while but then you 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 gain all your weight back so i started looking at this i got this guy what's he selling he wasn't selling anything so i reached out to him i go hey i'm a doc i'm kind of intrigued by what you're talking about can we touch and jason reached out right back to me and emailed me and we started talking and he really had a huge influence on me because I started realizing that when we get a new diabetic, if you check their insulin level, it's high most of the time. And we think their sugars are high, so we have to put them on insulin to get rid of the extra sugar. So that's the problem. He said, that's not the problem. You're going to see they're going to have high insulin most of the time, right? Right before they get diabetes. And so then I started looking at insulin, and then I went down the rabbit hole of all these things, and I started cutting out my carbs, and I started losing weight. And then my patients were asking me, hey, doc, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I can't really tell you <laughs> because I was well aware that Professor Noakes was going on trial and all these things were happening in the low carb community. I go, well, you know, we got to keep our, you know, this is between us type thing. And then my patients started getting better. And I was like, oh, you know, I said, I can't recommend this, but this is what I'm doing. You could do what you want, but here's the recommendation and here's what I'm doing. You could, you could choose for yourself. So anyways, we started, I started seeing my patients getting better and I was kind of blown away by that. And then within six months, I had 11 people come off insulin. And I had never seen that before, you know, and I laughed at these people. You know, you, you heard about these chiropractors saying, well, we'll get you off all your meds. I go, that's impossible. These people are crazy. They're going to kill people. Then you start realizing they get it more than I do <laughs> when you start talking to them and they understand insulin resistance, you know. So that was kind of my road that, that I started realizing that I had to make some life changes too. And being in chronic stress, sleep deprived, all these things that Ben Bickman talks about, uh, I realized I was, I was a victim of all those things. So when you talk about like seeing your patients come off with insulin, did you see a lot of patients like lowering their A1Cs? Yeah, absolutely. The ones who did it, the ones who bought in. So, but my my struggle was I was in this this model where you have eight minutes with a patient. How do I spend an hour teaching preventive medicine to someone in, in eight minutes? Yeah. So I knew it couldn't be done. So I had to figure out the the way to make the system work. And in the standard model, I just couldn't make it work because I could work faster. I could work harder. I could get more efficient. I could dictate more on my notes, but it wasn't helping that patient in front of me anymore, right? So the problem is it's so much easier to say, oh, you have high sugars here. Here's insulin. Here's the blood pressure medicine. Here's a cholesterol medicine. Here's something for your anxiety. Here's something for your heartburn. And say, so we'll see you next time. And then we'll adjust the medicine. And then you adjust up the medicine the next time. And then you adjust up again. Then their sugars get worse. And so you get frustrated and think no one's listening to me. But the reality was we were giving bad advice. Because we were telling them, here for breakfast, have your green smoothies and <laughs> do all these things that were causing them to get worse. Then they need more insulin. So when you start realizing, uh oh, maybe we need to reverse this. And when you start thinking differently, it's, it, it's like one of those, I think it was one of those pictures you look at and it looks like a bunch of dots. And as you stare at it for long enough, then all of a sudden you see something in 3D. It was kind of like that. Uh, I started seeing, I think, wait, this doesn't make sense, what we're doing. Because if I'm getting you insulin, and what do I base your insulin dose on? It's the number of carbohydrates you eat. So I'll say, how many carbs do you eat for breakfast? Oh, okay, then you get this much insulin. If you eat so much carbs for lunch, you get this much insulin for lunch. And so we just go down that path without saying, how about if we don't give them the carbohydrates? How much <laughs> insulin do they need? Right. Right? And that's why, like some of my partners, we would get into debates about it. And I said, well, it doesn't make sense. I go, what do you do with your patient who's on insulin? They come to breakfast and they're nausea and they can't eat breakfast. How much insulin do you give them? And they said, well, you don't give them insulin because they're not eating because they'll get low sugars, right? Yes. Okay, they get to lunch and they can't eat. What do you give them, <laughs> right? So if they can't eat. So you realize that you're giving them insulin for what they're eating. So how about if I tell them to eat eggs for breakfast? How much insulin do I give them? None because <laughs> they don't need it for that. A type 2 diabetic, I want to terrify that. So there are certain things you look at and you say, wow, that doesn't make sense. So the more sugar I give you, the more, and then you put the diabetic in the hospital and they give him an, you know, IV fluids full of sugar, mm -hmm. right? That's the last thing they need. So you say, well, stop the sugar water and then their sugar's normalized. Then they don't need insulin. So you give them sugar in one arm and insulin in the other arm. It makes zero sense, right? Because they have an oversupply of sugar and that's their problem. So, you know, sometimes you just, things in medicine just pass down and down and down and no one sits back critically. You know, if it weren't for Jason Fung, maybe I would never would have gotten it. <laughs> you know, maybe I'd be in a, in a different situation right now. But yeah, that's that's when you start thinking like, oh, we have to think about this problem differently because Jason was looking at it from an insulin resistance standpoint of saying, if you need a ton of insulin to get rid of the sugar, why don't you make your body more sensitive to that insulin? You know, the argument that he would use is alcohol. If someone came to a standard doctor and said, look, doctor, I'm drinking 12 beers a night and I can't get drunk and I want to get drunk, what should I do? 
And we say, well, I'll have 12, 14, 16, 18. Just keep going up on it until you get to the effect you want. Or we could say, hey, why don't we cut back on your alcohol? Because that's going to cause liver disease and all kinds of other problems. And then if you cut back your alcohol for the next three weeks, if you go out with your friends, you have one beer and you feel it. You don't need to have 14 beers anymore. So this concept, for some reason, is very difficult for doctors to understand that, hey, if you cut down on the carbohydrates, you don't need as much insulin anymore because you don't need insulin to get rid of the carbohydrates you're not eating. So it's really it's really an amazing paradigm shift. So before you found keto and started sort of recommending this to patients, my question is, in all those years of medicine, had you ever seen even a pill be able to do the same thing that you're seeing the ketogenic way of eating do? Like, what, was there ever a pill that would drastically take somebody from an 8.0 A1C down to a 5.2 A1C? I've never seen it. I've never, that's the thing is I had never seen it. I had seen people get their sugars down for a while, but what you had to do is in order to keep them at that same level, it would start creeping back up again. Then you say, okay, let's add this drug on and let's add this drug on. So no one's thinking, why don't we stop? Even, you know, some of the newer medicines basically make you, the higher your sugars go, it makes you pee out more sugar. But the problem is you get urinary infections, you get genital infections, you get all these other problems associated with that. So people just don't think about it. It's like, well, if I'm not eating the sugar, then I don't have to pee out the extra sugar anymore, right? As a matter of fact, it's dangerous if you do a keto diet on some of these, some of these medicines. So we have to taper them off those medicines before they go on, on a ketogenic diet, you know? So it's really frustrating because yes, the people get worse and worse. And that's why you know, people like Dr. Unwin, who was around a long time, who, who got burned out because he said, all my diabetics are going on dialysis, amputation. I've, se I've seen the horror stories. And people say, why are you passionate? That's why, because I know what's coming. It's like when you know, if you see someone running towards the cliff, you know what's coming. So when you see the cliff coming and you're saying, hey, you're going towards the cliff, you're going towards the cliff, then you start screaming, you're going towards the cliff, and they don't stop. They're going to go off the cliff. There's nothing you can do to help that person. And the sad part about diabetes is most of the time people get it by the time it's too late, and now they have peripheral neuropathy, they've had amputations, they're in kidney failure, they go blind. They have all these consequences of diabetes, and it, it's not a scare story. It's what it happens. That's the, the, the toxicity of high sugars for so long. So we've seen these out, cardiovascular disease, you know, heart disease, everything. If you go, okay, what's the number one cause of all these diseases? You see diabetes in there. So you start realizing it's not just that your sugars are a little high and that you can eat cookies and shoot more insulin to get rid of the, the sugar. So when you start realizing that, you think, well, insulin is not making that. Doctors think that when you shoot insulin, the sugar just magically disappears somewhere. But it's in the body. It's just hidden in a different place where you don't see it in the bloodstream anymore. I think that um, we're on the same hamster wheel as doctors, as patients. You know, patients are on that same hamster wheel of believing pills fix stuff and I don't need to change my lifestyle in any way. And I think a lot of times we put pressure on doctors to be like, get, you know, get with it and let's talk about nutrition and why don't doctors talk about nutrition and why are they always like pushing pills? And, you know, we kind of give doctors a bad rap, but pa patients, we don't always bring our best to the relationship either because it, I know in the past, you know, I had doctors that suggested me moving my body and reducing stress. And I was like, I don't want to do those things. I, I want to keep, you know, the same breakneck pace in my life and not do anything differently. Just give me a pill that's, you know, more intense. How can we as patients bring a better attitude to our doctor's appointments. Yeah, it's a hard thing because it goes both ways. I mean, both people feel the same way. Just give me a pill I and mean, I want to give you a pill because I can I can bring the cure to your problem. It's not a cure. We're just putting it off longer, right? Because it's, you know, there's certain things you know, you could it's inevitable what's coming. So you could delay it if you want, but you're still going to have the bad outcomes because the toxicity is the problem, right? So, and the other problem is really what I, the biggest, <laughs> the biggest uh, uh, challenge I had was people would come in and then we put them on a low carb diet and then they don't need their insulin anymore. Their blood pressure normalizes. Their mood gets better. Their anxiety gets better. Their heartburn. All these things I'm seeing, like the magic pill, the movie. I mean, that's what happens. And, and when you first see it, you think, uh-oh. Uh and then you start taking, you go, I don't think you need this medicine. And they said, no, no, no. My doctor said I need to take that the rest of my life. I can never come off that. I was like, well, you don't need it. Your sugar's normal and your blood pressure is normal. So it's a hard thing because people are so convinced that if they, and doctors are afraid too from the other perspective. is like, we're afraid to stop medicines. When I first started, Mark Kukazella. And a couple of people were out there talking about deep prescribing. I'm like, what is that? What is deep prescribing? 
de-prescribing is taking away meds that have been there. Because the problem is, and I gave a talk on this in Florida, and it's amazing. It seems silly, but these were real cases that I was talking about. But, you know, someone is an athlete, they hurt their back, and then all of a sudden they can't work out anymore. Then they start gaining weight, and then they're taking something for their back pain, and now they have stomach problems. Now they take a stomach medicine. Now they're back hurts, they can't sleep, and now they're having anxiety and depression. And you see how many drugs you get thrown on very quickly for all these different problems, right? So that, that's what I mean. It, this, this acceleration of medications, we all know that seniors, if you see a senior who's in their 70s who, who's not on any meds, it's shocking. So I have patients all the time who aren't on any medications at all, and they get hit by a truck or something happens, and they end up in the, in the ER, and the doctors are like, what do you mean you're not on medicines? Like, this is, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's like a unicorn. Like, people don't see that. So when you see healthy people that are seniors, it's, it's shocking to people, you know? I have a 76 year old in, in my practice. She's going with me on a medical trip to Guatemala and she's she has more energy. I'm hoping I can keep up with her. You know, wow. she's reversed her diabetes. She's got her health. Her mood is better. Everything is better on this, this patient. And she's, she's out helping people. And that's another big, like what you're doing is helping people and being positive and, and trying to encourage people. You live longer that way, you know, and you enjoy life at least longer, you know? So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how we just think, oh, I'm getting older, so I'm slowing down and I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch TV and not do anything anymore because I'm not contributing to society. But I have 86-year-olds who are doing great stuff. You know, they're all hiking and, you know, out in the desert doing stuff and collecting rocks or doing whatever. But, you know, unfortunately, we see a lot of people now in their 60s staring at the wall in a nursing home. But yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard conundrum because it takes effort. You know, when we're tired all the time, we don't want to exercise. But guess what? When you feel better, then, now you feel like exercising again and you feel like doing stuff and then you feel better. And then you don't sit around thinking about food all day, you know, getting distracted a little bit. It's a good thing. So you're talking a little about medicine. And, and so I'm sure you're aware there's a new trend going around throwing a diabetic medication at using it, like, I guess, off label for weight loss. And do you see dangers in this now? There's absolutely no question in my mind there's dangers. You know, any medicine we shoot into has dangers. There's risk and benefits of everything. So the, the problem is we see dramatic weight loss. We do. But guess what? It, it comes at the expense of you're making more fat cells, right? So the new fat cells. So basically insulin resistance is the fat cells, if you can think of it as a water balloon, they get so full that you're, the fat cells say, no insulin. I can't take any more fat. I'm full to the max. I'm going to explode. Send it to the next fat cell. So then the other one fills up. So sooner or later, they all fill up. And by definition, what happens is once all those fat cells are filled up, you have nowhere else to put the energy. Where do you put it? In the bloodstream. That's diabetes. Basically, what these drugs are doing is saying, okay, instead of having 300 fat cells, just as an example, now we're going to expand those fat cells up to 500 fat cells. Now all those other ones aren't full, so you can start putting more in over there. So you drop the insulin level down because those new fat cells aren't blown up to the max where it's hard to shove it in. And so that is the conundrum is once you go off the medicine, now you have a lot more fat cells to fill up. And, you know, they say if you build it, they will come. So the more mm -hmm. fat cells you have, the more potential you have of getting fat. Of it. <laughs> so, for instance, liposuction, one of the things people don't realize, if you do liposuction, it, it sucks out all the external fat cells, what, what we call subcutaneous fat. So then when I have extra energy coming in because I don't change my lifestyle, where does it go? To the visceral fat, which is the most dangerous form of fat because you don't, it, it's, you took out the, all the external storage units out in the safe area. Now it has to go to the dangerous area. So that's the problem we run into. We increase cardiovascular, even though they weigh less, they're still metabolically sick because they still have the, a lot of visceral fat. So really it's not about weight necessarily. It's about visceral fat, right? The visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat. The visceral fats are stuff in the liver where people have fatty liver disease, which is a precursor to diabetes too, because once the liver fills up with fat, all of its fat stores, where do you put the extra sugar? You have nowhere to put it. Now you have diabetes. So by definition, if you have diabetes, you have fatty liver disease. I really appreciate you talking about this because I think that, you know, we're all sort of guilty of wanting, you know, a quick fix. We want weight loss and we want it now. Like, you know, we, we read magazine articles you know, on the covers of magazines in the checkout line and they're promising, you know, you could lose 30 pounds before you get this shopping cart to your car. So like, that's exactly how fast I want to lose weight. And it really is a daily choice to maintain health. And it's really, you know, hundreds of decisions all day long to do the right thing. And something that really struck me when you were speaking in Utah was all of the individual CGMs 
that you had. Like basically you were letting us have a picture of what was happening in different patients day and how certain decisions, whether it was to exercise or it was to have a sushi roll, um, caused a, a spike on those CGMs. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, a singular decision in your day really can influence your day? And it could not even be your choice. I'm telling you, I see it all the time. As an example, two days ago, one of my favorite patients who we had to struggle to get him off his meds, it was he has a genetic disorder where he, he, he has a glycogen storage disease where he can't release his sugar very well. So it was a battle because I had to give him enough calories so that he wasn't dying and miserable because if you if you can't get your fat stores or your sugar stores, you're miserable. His insulin was through the roof. He had all kinds of health. So we got him doing great. So anyways, I see him and I, I was teasing him. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Your sugars have been perfect all week. The day you're going to see me, you make it go over 200, like right before, like an hour before I saw him. I'm like, what did you do? He said, you're not going to believe this, doc. Here's what happened. I went out to din- uh, out to lunch and I got a uh, grilled grilled chicken on top of lettuce. And I brought my own dressing because I know I'm supposed to eat this dressing. And, and a Coke Zero, right? A big Coke Zero. He goes, I usually don't drink that, but it, I was in a business meeting. So I thought, oh, I'll have a Coke Zero. So he's in, he goes, wow, this is really good. I haven't had this in a while. It's really it tastes like the real Coke. And all of a sudden, his alarm started beeping on his CGM and it was a massively high sugar. And so he thought, hmm, that can't be me. And then he looked and he said, holy cow, I'm over 200. How can this possibly be? He went up to the front desk and said, hey, uh, is there any chance that you mixed the Coke and the Coke Zero? And they, lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. They went in and checked the machine. They said, oh my gosh, we switched the two. <laughs> we switched it backwards, right? If he didn't have a CGM, he wouldn't have known that. And he could have had a hyperglycemic. And then he got hypoglycemic later because the insulin spike that he got as a result. So that's one example. And, and the other thing is I can't tell just looking at a continuous glucose monitor unless you put down what happened. Because if you run a marathon or you sprint, you're going to look like you eat five donuts because you get a sugar response. So not all sugar responses are bad. They're physiologic. So depending on what you're doing or if you're stressed or you're not sleeping. And so I can look at the continuous glucose monitor and I could even tell if someone has a urinary infection, right? Because they'll start saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, look, your sugars are up. Whenever a diabetic has an effect, any diabetic out there knows if they're stressed, they're not sleeping, they're tense, all of a sudden, then all of a sudden your sugars start going up. So it's not just what you're eating. So it is, there's a lot of stuff. And and like we were talking about habits, good habits, it's one of those things you don't see the results or the fruit of your labor for a long time. So if I want apples and I plant an apple tree tomorrow, I put a seed in the ground, I'll go, it hasn't grown yet in a day. I give up and rip it out. No, you say it's going to take time. You understand these things take time to develop and it's going to take watering and you got to go sing to your little tree and watch it grow. So with weight loss, we want it to happen tomorrow. So it's really trying to fix all the old. And the, the more metabolically sick we are, the longer it takes because we have more visceral fat, which is like like uh, thick wood to burn through rather than just some kindling that burns very quickly. And some people just gain five pounds and lose five pounds. But you know, it really, it's, it's a spectrum and we're all individuals. So we can't, just because Sean Baker does something doesn't mean I can do that. And what, you know, what some people can do doesn't mean that works for you. And it may not be the lifestyle you want. Some people say, look, I'm not giving up sourdough bread. And we go, okay, instead of doing it five times a day, can we do it three times a week and see how you feel? And then they see their sugar readings and that convinces them because no one wants to see their sugar go to 400. Mm-hmm. So when they stop eating, they go, the days I don't eat it, my sugars look great. Okay, I want to do that more and do it less frequently. And then, you know, we can learn. I think that's the thing of the, the continuous glucose mark. It's not only a lie detector test, because someone says, I'm not eating any, eating any carbs, and I see their sugar's going crazy at 10 o'clock every night. Then I say, well, there's something going on. Either you're working out, something's going on. And so we, we can figure out what the problem is. It is very frustrating for people sometimes to, you know, but the more tools we have, the more data points we have, the better off we can see that, that people are doing. For, so for instance, weight loss is one of the worst markers. I have a lady just yesterday, her weight has been plateaued for the last six weeks or eight weeks but her visceral fat has dropped dramatically and her muscle mass has been going up. So on the scale, she's frustrated. I go, how do your clothes fit? She goes, oh, my pants are falling down. I had to tighten my belt two loops. And you go, okay, don't worry about the weight then. Who cares? You're putting on muscle mass. That's exactly what we want. So that's the problem. And and that's one of the the other things with these drugs. The last study I saw showed more muscle mass loss than fat mass loss with these drugs. So you lose your muscle mass, that's your metabolic rate. You're in trouble. So if you're gaining weight, putting on muscle mass, who cares? Because you're stronger and you're metabolically healthier. And one of the biggest indicators of longevity is muscle mass. So if I'm starving you and you lose muscle mass, but you're losing weight, am I doing you a favor in the long run? We're not. 
Now, I want to talk more about CGMs, but I did want to give you a little hint that you can let people know about. I learned this from our friend Chris Bear. If you are like myself and like to occasionally go out to a restaurant and have a diet soda and you're worried about something like, you know, them giving you a regular soda instead, those little glucose test strips, you know, the little one, like the stick P test, if you dip them in your soda, if they're sugar in it, it'll, it'll actually show. So you can carry a vial of those, have your wife or keep a couple in your pocket when you go out to a restaurant. And just when they bring you your soda, just dip that little sugar thing in there. And if it turns, you've got regular Coke instead of Diet Coke. So back to the CGM, I know that you really do incorporate the CGM in your practice. And you said now that you run a different type of practice, right? You're not reliant on all of the insurance companies. Yeah. And most of my patients are cash pay. So they, they buy the continuous glucose monitor. You know, most of them will be $75 for a month. And I think for doing it for a month is the best education you'll ever get. Cause it's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. So if you say, here's a new recipe, it's keto. And then all of a sudden there's your sugars are going crazy and you're gaining weight. You go, okay, maybe this isn't the best recipe for me. Right. So there's a lot of stuff, as you know, I mean, obviously not your information, but there's bad information out there. So I go, this is keto because we're making it with different, you know, we're using coconut sugar. It's like, well, it's coconut sugar. It's still sugar. It's going to, it's the same thing. So anyway, certain things like that, uh, uh, you know, it, there's a lot where, where you can see for yourself what's happening. You don't need my opinion or your opinion because I'll tell you, the other day it happened to me. I, I was in a hurry. I was taking my wife somewhere and, and she had some meat that she had marinated in balsamic vinegar and, and oil. And I had had it for dinner two days before that. And I wasn't thinking about it, but we had it. And on the way out the door, I was taking her somewhere. I was in a hurry. I grabbed two handfuls of, of um, blueberries, which I normally don't eat. And I had it. Then we were driving back. And I said, wow, my sugars are high. That's weird. I wonder what happened. Was I stressed today? No, no. Nah. I went through the whole thing. And I said, what did you marinate that meat in, by the way? And she said, well, balsamic vinegar. Oh, that must have really did it. But then I forgot about the blueberries. And I go, oh, the dang blueberries all at once that I took. That did it. It wasn't that because I, I two days ago I went back and looked and when I had a big plate of that stuff, it didn't spike my sugars at all. So I go, oh, it's the blueberries that did. So I reacted, but it doesn't mean you're going to react to blueberries that way. So that's why the CGM can identify because I have some people, strawberries will make their sugars high, but blueberries don't. I have one guy, he ate six kiwi fruit and his sugars did not move at all. So I was like, well, that's better for you than half a banana and his sugar goes to 220. <laughs> so, you know, it's things like that when you start seeing these big excursions and it may be individual. I don't think we know enough yet, but some people can handle different carbohydrates better than others. You may absorb it slower. It may be, you know, different physiologic responses. So it, there's not a one size. So that's why some people I'll see it and, and it's hilarious because they, they do something. They say, my friend did that and they didn't have any response. Look at me. Or it also depends on how insulin sensitive you are. So someone who's metabolically healthier can get away with way more than someone who's diabetic and they could eat the same exact thing and have massively different responses. So do you think that a CGM is something that everybody should explore at least one time, especially if they're like on a ketogenic way of eating? You know, I, you know, I've thought about that. It's more of a cost issue and a supply issue, you know, than every single person does it. An eight-year-old kid need to do it? Probably not, you know, but I think anyone who goes into nutrition or diabetes education should wear one just as part of their education. Because for me, it was very, very enlightening because I realized, oh, if I work out really hard, my sugar goes crazy. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, you know, just today I interviewed a type one diabetic for the podcast and we talked about that. He's an exercise physiologist. He just published with Don D'Agostino and, and, and a lot of the big names out there, uh, Professor Noakes. And they showed that, that, that the exercise response to, to sugars. And, and I was asking him personally what happens when you actually, he said, if I do high intensity interval training, like if I sprint and I have to shoot extra insulin before I do that because my sugars go crazy high and I feel bad. So if I shoot and, and you would think it's the opposite, you would think if you're exercising hard, you would lower your insulin because or your sugars because your muscles are burning up sugar, but it's not true. You get a stress response from that. So it's really, inter I'm like, when should a type one diabetic then be carb loading? They don't need to when you look at the data and they're looking at their continuous glucose monitor while they're doing max exercise, you know, scientifically. So, you know, and then uh, obviously it depends if you have ketones floating around or what your body's using for fuel. So we're learning a lot, even in the, in the physiology world, they don't know all the answers, but they were making assumptions of what we're seeing. So we had a live stream last night and we were talking a little bit about CGMs. We were talking about the fact that you were going to be on the podcast today. And, you know, I've said all the time, I think that if, if you're at all concerned about sugar, and, you know, we get a lot of people who, hey, I did a finger stick and my glucose is 90 in when I wake up in the morning and I'm really concerned or, 
you know, I, I checked myself today and it was, it was 97 and I'm like, okay, well, what, what did you do before? Were you exercising? Cause like you said, you know, getting a pimple can, can increase your glucose. And, you know, so I've always said that I think that it's something that we should explore at least once, because sometimes it'll put your mind at ease when you start realizing, oh, if I work out, you know, my glucose will go up. That doesn't mean I shouldn't work out. I learned once I was on a 72 hour fast, 48 hours in, my glucose was completely stable. I got up at like two o'clock in the morning to use the restroom. And when I was looking at my CGM, my glucose went from like 80 to over 120. Just me getting up to go to the restroom because my How body old started are you? creating glucose. But one of our subscribers last night said they, they were type two diabetic and they asked their doctor for a prescription for CGM. And the doctor said, um, you don't need one of those. It's a waste of money. Just do an A1C test. How do we go again about getting a CGM if we aren't a diabetic and we want to, you know, explore this more and really help ourselves with our metabolic syndrome? Yeah, it's frustrating because you have to track down a doctor like me who goes, yeah, I'll write your prescription for that and I'll monitor for you if you want, you know, so we can look at it and really get education. So, you know, that's part of what I do, too. Some people say, look, my doctor won't do a coronary calcium score. They don't know what an insulin. They won't order it. So it's like for me, it's like I'll order it for you if you want. I don't care. You know, I but, you know, it's it for me, it gives us the most information. I'll tell you. I cannot imagine doing what I do or practicing medicine without knowing what a fasting insulin level is on, on my patients. Because it's everything. Because just because someone has high sugars doesn't mean that they don't have insulin or that they have too much insulin. So I've seen extremes where some people just don't make enough insulin. Like in the Indian and Asian communities, they don't make enough insulin. They're not insulin resistant. They just don't make enough insulin. So how do I fix that problem? To be as insulin sensitive as you can, how do I do that? Put on muscle mass. Watch your stress, get enough sleep, all these other things, because there's two different problems going on. Some people have both. Like we have type ones now, they're insulin resistant because they've been shooting so much insulin that they're gaining weight and now they're insulin resistant, which type ones have never been insulin resistant. They just don't make insulin. So that's what I'm getting at. And that's the problems we're doing to people. When they say, you know, tell Dr. Lenskis, you know, to mind his own business, you can eat cookies all day long and I'll just give you more and more insulin. So what you're creating is someone who is now insulin dependent. Now they're insulin resistant. So they need more and more and more insulin to get that same effect. So that's the problem we run into is, is doctors say, here's a year. You, you don't have to change your life. So I'll just do this. But the people who understand, they say, look, I don't want to be shooting insulin 10 times a day. And then, you know, being up with hypoglycemia, all the ramifications that happen. If you stabilize those blood sugars, you do better from a mood standpoint, from an energy, from, you know, it, it, there's a ton of other things that benefit. High insulin raises blood pressure. So if we lower the insulin level down, the blood pressure gets better. It's not because of the weight loss. It's because of the insulin control, right? So if we get someone who's stressed out, they come into the office, they're stressed and tense, their blood pressure goes up, right? So let's sit there calmly and listen to calming music or, or you know, other stuff that we do. And then the blood pressure normalizes. You know, so there's a lot of these things where, um, you know, if we just think for a minute, we could really help people a lot. But it is frustrating that I, I'll give you an example. A patient, I just saw her family member today. This patient came in. She's I think she's 80, 80 years old. And they go, look, this poor lady, she's, she's, she's having panic attacks, anxiety. She's throwing up all the time. She had all kinds of health problems. And I was like, oh, geez, I, it, it might be the damage is done and I can't really help this person. And once I, I go, let's put a CGM on her. And they say, well, the, her doctor says it's not necessary. And I go, well, she's on some medicines that can cause hypoglycemia. Let's just look. So she was on a medicine called glipizide, which I think should be taken off the market, honestly. It does, all it does is forces your body to make more insulin to get rid of the sugar that you shouldn't be eating in the first place. So anyways, she was getting three hypoglycemic episodes a day. Every time she got hypoglycemic, they said, oh, she's having another panic attack, right? Because she was hypoglycemic. If she wasn't having panic, no one was looking, so they didn't see it. So once one day, CG and my colleagues said, stop that medicine. That's the problem. She hasn't had a panic attack now for a year. Because wow, it wasn't goodness. a panic attack. Now she's off Xanax. Now you're putting an you know, 80-year-old lady on, on Xanax or, you know, a medicine that can make her fall and break a hip. And then what happens? She's a disaster. We did, I just talked to her. I go, I haven't seen your mom in a while. She goes, oh, my gosh. She's walking two miles a day. She's out doing. She was throwing up all the time because she was getting hypoglycemic episodes. And the medicines were toxic. So we, now she's off all of her meds and she's happy. So those kind of things, you go, gosh, darn it. Yeah, a CGM in her case was totally life-changing. Life-saving, I would say. Like, I think we saved her life because she would have died with one of these. Hy you get hypoglycemic, you pass out, you break your hip. And the doctor says, absolutely useless. You know, guess what? It, it was definitely useful because right away, she does not get hypo. Her sugars are flat as a raw. I mean, <laughs> flat as a pancake, right? 
So it's, it's just really amazing. And you see that we're mismanaging people like that because, you know, they say, well, 75 bucks is too much. Well, how much did the drugs cost that exactly. we have her off now? She's saving $300 a month in drug costs that she didn't need in the first place because she changed her lifestyle. Now she's walking. Now she's happy. You know, she's joking again. She was, they were going to put her in a nursing home. That's how bad it was. And I said, look, let's, let's try this. So let's give it, maybe I can help her, but let's try it for a month and she, dramatic improvement. So when you see stuff like that, you think, you know what, I'll argue with you anytime you want about that because that was life changing. And, and so many people I've seen hypoglycemia being a problem. So that's why I love the CGM because if we adjust, make certain adjustments, they do better. Because, you know, the other thing that's really anyone out there listening, if you're getting hypoglycemic, low blood sugar problems, a lot of times that's a precursor to diabetes. So people say, well, I'm getting low sugar. I'll never get diabetes. You're going to get diabetes probably because it's the overreaction of the insulin, then your sugars go low and you want to pass out. So Tro and I will have people that come in with multiple hypoglycemia, low blood sugars during the day. And we say, okay, let's cut your carbohydrates. Let's go do gentle exercise. And the hypoglycemia goes away by cutting out the sugars. So you're not getting these up, this, this mountain of insulin and sugar chasing each other all day, right? So yeah, it's amazing when you see it. And when you see it with a continuous glucose monitor, it tells us exactly what happens because you will not see people getting low sugars without a preemptive high sugar most of the time. If not, there's, there's something else going on. But a few days of that, we know. You don't have to have the CGM your whole life. But I think doing it just for your own education, say, what happens if I drink beer at night? What happens if I do this? What happens if I have a margarita will happen? And then you see it and think, uh-oh, okay, I'm going to choose something different. If you have pasta versus a steak or a salmon, you can make those choices now because you have an educated, you see what happens and you know. So after we do it for a while, we know the answer. So we don't have to keep doing those things. But, you know, for it, not that you have to do it forever. But for some people, it is it is an amazing tool to use. Well, and it's so powerful that you can have some control because in the past, when you were just getting medicated and you're having to deal with all the side effects of the medicine and you're just it's almost like you're just throwing it at a dartboard. Like, I hope this you know, moves me in the direction of, of something good, but you're never sure what is your problem having that CGM and seeing like, oh, it is stress at work that I'm going to need to deal with. It is my sleep. It is what I am eating. It's the fact that when I'm thinking, oh, just one cookie is not a big deal, but it is having an impact. And just knowing and being faced with the data is so empowering because then you can truly make a choice for yourself. You know, we used to have that ignorance is bliss attitude when it came to some of our life choices. And I'm so thankful that we're willing to face the choices. And I think a CGM does provide that. Um, something- uh, just to answer your question, Joe, just, just to go back to that while we're talking about it. The, the danger I see of continuous glucose monitors is having them in the hands of clinicians who aren't educated. Because the problem is they're going to say, you know what, Joe, every day at two o'clock, your sugars are going way too high. We got to put you on more drugs to get that sugar down. Instead of saying, what are you doing at two o'clock, Joe? Oh, you're drinking soda at two o'clock? Why don't we get rid of that soda and see if you need that? That's the problem is it will be mismanaged until people understand what they're doing with that information. Mm -hmm. For instance, my, I, I remember I showed my continuous glucose monitor to a dietitian who was complaining about the crazy keto people. She didn't realize my type of medicine back then. So anyways, she's saying that, look, it's dangerous. And I showed her my, I go, here's my CGM readings fasted. And, and, you know, I went through, she was looking at my numbers. I go, do my numbers look dangerous to you? Where do you see hypoglycemia? But look at this big sugar spike you got. What was that from? I said, I worked out, I did kickboxing. It was from kickboxing. Was that dangerous then? I shouldn't do kickboxing. Is that what you're saying? Should I not exercise because it raises my sugar? So until you understand what those things mean, and that's why I think it's important to document those things on the, the continuous glucose monitor, you know? And, and so, you know, the other thing is having, you know, for patients out there, look on, you know, the, the metabolic health uh, uh, practice uh, list of all the doctors out there, because you'll find someone like, you know, Rob Sivis or Tro Kalasian or me or someone who understands the stuff that can help you. But going to someone who doesn't know, it's like, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. That is so true. We found that to be the case, you know, having, you know, a doctor that can interpret the numbers correctly. Because I can remember Dr. Sivis going over our lab work and saying like, Rachel, uh, this tells me one of two things. Either you are type one diabetic or you're on keto, one of the two. So like this could be, you know, very scary if you do not have someone who knows what they're looking at or at least knows I need to ask some follow up questions and not just handle this with medicine without asking, you know, those lifestyle questions that you're willing 
to ask and you're on the lookout for. Now, something else that you can't see, but that's going on on the inside of you is gut biome. Can you talk a little bit about what it is, why we need it, or if we need it? Yeah, there's, it's it, what well, we need it for sure. And, and it's going to change based on what your diet is. So it's a, it basically their little bacteria there in our intestine. There's way more bacteria in our intestine than cells in our body. And so when you start looking at it, you go, oh, what, what does that matter? And it's, I went down the rabbit hole. And as a matter of fact, there was a low carb doctor who's well known who jumped up my case a little bit and said, you got to just talk about science. It was actually at, at Utah. And said, so you got to just talk science. You can't talk this hocus pocus stuff. And I said, I reviewed 60 studies for this talk. And it was just a short part of my talk. But to think the gut microbiome doesn't affect us, it is, it, it, it is uh, I would say, irresponsible. because, Or you haven't looked. It's ignorance, really. Because the microbiome controls so much. There's studies. And I, I go through it in my talk. And it's dramatic. And when they go back and they look at obesity, uh, diabetes, and binge eating disorder, you go back and every single thing that contributes to that has to do with the microbiome. So number one was mom eating processed food and garbage food. And I talk to people all the time to go, my one daughter who struggles with weight is the one where the mom just ate whatever she wanted. The second time they learned their lesson, they eat healthy. And then that, that kid doesn't have weight problems and they eat the right foods. So, you know, stress in the house, you know, were you on antibiotics as a kid, just alone, you're having increased risk of all these things. And what do antibiotics do? They kill bacteria. So we say, I'm just, how many times in my career did I say, I'm just going to be safe. Your ear hurts. I'm going to be safe and put you on antibiotics. Well, that's not the safe thing to do. You have to understand that there's ramifications of these things. You kill off your good bacteria, the bad ones take over. And I've seen, I have clinical cases where I've seen dramatic uh, <laughs> uh, results from taking antibiotics for a prolonged period of time where people get colitis, where they get all these other health problems that happen. So it's not just that let's be safe. So, Stress is childhood, child abuse, you know, all these things. Stress hormones affect the gut microbiome. They affect the, the mucus layer in the colon. There's something called leaky gut that I used to laugh at, but you look at the data, it's very clear. It happens where you absorb these toxins from the colon and it, you get more inflammation, you get mood stuff, you get depression. You, there, there's dramatic studies in Germany showing that if you get one drop of this lipopolysaccharide, which is supposed to be in the gut, but if you absorb it, then all of a sudden you get depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts joint pains, autoimmune disease, all this stuff. So it's clear. So they've done studies with mice where they put them in a low stress environment versus a high stress environment. And they give them the same medicine. So they basically put them in Bob Marley land over here, listening to relaxing music and having fun. The other ones, there's bombs going off and their cats are chasing them in stress land. But when they bring them back together and they give them this one drug, all the stressed out ones got colitis. The ones who weren't stressed didn't get colitis. And then they looked at the the mucus layer in the colon, the stress out one had no mucus and their microbiome was like weeds. The other ones look like a garden, the happy ones, and they don't get colitis. So then what they did is they just took the microbiome out of the stressed out one and they put it into one of the healthy ones and then it got colitis. Then they took another healthy one. They took its healthy gut microbiome, put it in a sick one and it got healthy. Mm. So they say, wow, there's something to this microbiome stuff. So then what they did is they took the healthy group and they put them on antibiotics for a week and then they reintroduced, it reintroduced that same toxin and they all got colitis. So it shows that this gut microbiome plays a role. And there's a lot of back and forth uh, communications with, with Parkinson's disease, dementia. It's absolutely astounding. And if you're eating sugar and bad stuff, you're feeding the bad microbiome all the time. So if you change your diet to a healthier diet, then the microbiome improves. So there's yogurts out there that you can make yourself and, and you know, lactobacillus rotari helps with uh, oxytocin levels, which is shown to help with hormone, hormone levels and stress levels and all kinds. It's incredible what it does. So yeah, when they, but they, what, what they found is if you were born via C-section, right, you do worse than if you had vaginal birth because you get some of mom's uh, uh, microbiome. Also oxytocin passes like breastfeeding. Babies who are breastfed must much less likely than kids who are um, bottle fed. To have these kind of problems. So when you look at it, you start looking and saying, wow, that, this is pretty remarkable data. And there's, there's actually some great doctors doing what we call fecal transplants, which I laughed at when I heard about it, but they take the microbiome out of one person and they put it into someone else. And so people start craving the food that the person that the donor came from without even knowing them. So instead of craving cookies and donuts, now they crave kimchi, which they go, I never wanted kimchi, but I crave that now. So it's really amazing how much the gut microbiome can, can, uh, uh, affect us for sure from an emotional standpoint, from a stress. And, and so there's studies showing that if you eat terrible foods, like processed, highly processed food, the gut microbiome dies off and you get this thin mucus layer. 
So you get stressed out in life and all these other things. Irritable bowel syndrome gets worse. Everything does. So it's amazing that we can try to say that microbiome doesn't play a role at all. And it's something that you know, has to cross our mind at some point, because when you're eating a healthier diet, like what you're eating, your microbiome is going, going to change accordingly. And so based on what you're eating, your microbiome will change. So if you're eating toxic stuff that is it natural, then you don't have microbiome to break those things down. So I think that's something, it's still in the infancy, but we're going to learn a heck of a lot over the next couple of years about this. What about people who are eating mostly meat or they do carnivore for a little while and then they start incorporating vegetables back in and all of a sudden, like, they're like, my body doesn't handle it. Does that have to, something to do with the microbiome? Yeah, you know, we talked about that. I think it's an individualized thing. I think it's very interesting. For instance, if I never eat certain foods, uh, I don't develop, I, I lose the microbiome for that food because I don't eat it, right? So if I don't eat whatever, well, for instance, in, in Asian countries, uh, in Japan, for instance, they have microbiome that can digest the algae, the, the, the seaweed, right? That we can't digest because we're not used to eating that. They grew up eating that. So their body says, hey, this is helpful. We can get some nutritional value from this stuff. So if we eat the same food, we don't absorb it at all. So it is really interesting. So I don't know the answer. It's a great question because I think some people, there's something called lectins that are in certain foods and, you know, like fruits and vegetables. And some people, it will cause an inflammation of the gut lining and you lose your mucus layer and it will cause a problem. Eczema, for instance. Well, I've seen a lot of people go carnivore and their eczema goes away. So is it because it's intrinsic to the carnivore diet or are you taking something out? Are you getting something nutritionally in that you didn't have before? Or are you taking something out that was causing a problem? So some people, I think, will have a sensitivity to certain things and they'll get a, 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 an immune response. But I would think like carnivore, if you've been carnivore for a long time, uh, that maybe if you add in broccoli slowly over time, your body gets used to it and it's not so overwhelming and then you don't feel terrible. I don't know. Some people just feel terrible. It's like, okay. We, the best elimination diet is take everything out and eat meat. And then you add stuff back in and go, oh, I feel terrible when I have certain things. One of my guys just figured out that he cheese messes up his cholesterol and uh, he feels terrible. So he cut that out, his dairy, and he does great with meat diet. So it just depends on what you're doing too. And it's confounding a lot because of stress levels and all these other things that can affect the gut, right? So if your gut's healthy, maybe you can add those things back in. But I think you have to get your gut healthy at some point, you know, to, to, to counteract some of that. So what I'm getting at is if you're, if you're stress intense and don't sleep and hate the world and your mucus layer is very thin and you eat certain foods, it's probably going to affect you more than if you're, you're Bob Marley land relaxing all the time. What are some things we can eat that will feed the gut microbiome? You know, bone broth is great. It helps with the, the intestinal mucus and it, it rests the gut. Fasting, for instance. I mean, that's the thing is fasting. A three-day fast resets your entire gut microbiome, right? Mitty Pels has a great book talking about this. Um, Bill Davis has a great book called Super Gut talking about what can you put in? So I make my own yogurt, right? If your oxytocin is low, then make some yogurt. There's studies showing that not only food, but you know, getting a massage, meditation, yoga, uh, sauna, cold immersion, all these things help the gut microbiome. It changes it. But food-wise, kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, you know, kefir. It's a different drink, type uh, of fermented foods. Yeah, fermented foods. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what am I blanking on? One of my monks made me some, and it almost killed my sugars when I have crazy. Uh, the fermented drink, like so, oh, kombucha. Like, uh, Kombucha. Yeah. Yeah. Kombucha. Yeah. So kombucha, I'm drinking out. My sugars go crazy. I'm like, what is that? I didn't even eat all day. I was like, oh, I had the kombucha. That's why I drank too much of the kombucha at one time. But you know, there's a trade-off. Who cares if your sugars go up a little bit, if you have kombucha every once in a while. So yeah. So a lot of stuff like that. But I think the big one that people miss is the effect of stress on the microbiome and the, and, and the gut. It is a huge deal. And we've known that forever. Like aerobic bowel syndrome uh, gets worse if you're stressed. You know, and it could have to do with the mucus layer and the, the inflammation in the colon for sure. So we're seeing that and the lipopolysaccharide, you know, causes inflammation. So there's a lot of stuff we have. We're, we're in the infancy, but we're seeing people have remarkable improvements by changing their diet. It's interesting. A lot of times when we have coaching clients, they want to get their nutrition on point, like exactly precisely what am I supposed to eat? And then they eat those things and they're still in a stall. They're still having frustrations. And then we start talking about, let's deal with the stress. Let's deal with what's going on at work, your, your workload, what you're taking on, your lack of sleep. And, and people do not want to change that aspect of their life. They would much rather say like, what exactly should I eat? And I will just eat that thing in the midst of the chaos. And 
I wonder what do you recommend to your patients when they are willing to start taking a look at the stress that they actually need to eliminate? Yeah, that's a huge thing. It's just like anything. It's it's kind of like this calories in, calories out model. Like, you know, it's so oversimplified because the problem is that's like me if you're drowning in the ocean saying, hey, just breathe more air than water and you're going to be fine. Well, that's <laughs> nice, but you're in the middle of the ocean drowning, right? It's mm-hmm. So people who are under stress, that's when I start looking at the effects of stress, which is overwhelming. I speak from, you know, my old practice of working 18 hour days, not sleeping, rushing around like an idiot. If I sat and did nothing, I felt guilty, you know, and so I had to be doing something all the time. And I know the physiologic effects of that on me and weight gain and stress levels and insulin and cortisol. And I was like, well, if I'm trying to lower my cortisol, and that's the crazy thing about pharma to me is I'm reading study after study talking about oxytocin, having dramatic improvements on cholesterol, fat metabolism, metabolic rate, bone density, muscle mass, all positive stuff. And at the end of the study, they say, yeah, we're trying to figure out a drug that will do this. So it's like, well, spend time with your husband or wife, go have fun, go for a walk in the park. Take it easy. We, ben Vickman just released data on on doing sauna three days a week, you know, for 15 minutes or something like that. Dro- lowers your cortisol 30%. So those things you go, okay. Because for me, it's hard. It's like when someone says, hey, I have a patient who's paranoid. Can you give him a pill for that? It's like I try to give him a pill and they're paranoid. They're not going to want to take the pill. They're not going to listen to me because they think I'm trying to kill them. You're right. And it's the same thing if you're stressed out all the time. I go, I got bad news for you. This is stress related. <laughs> so we got to work on that. But it's hard because if I tell you it's stress related and that's killing you and then you're stressed already, then you get more stressed because you're stressed, right? right. So it's, that, it's that, that conundrum we get into. So it's like, hey, can you take 10 minutes during the day and breathe? Just deep breathing, you know, Wim Hof breathing or doing these square breathing where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds. You know, those kind of things, they sound so hokey, ho- hocus pocus, but it helps people. I see their sugars come down when they just go, you know what? So I have one lady. She's doing dramatically better. She's a CEO of a huge corporation. Now she takes Saturdays off and she goes, no emails, no calls, no nothing on Saturday. I don't deal with work stuff. And she goes, I'm happier. I'm laughing more. I'm, I'm doing more stuff with friends. And that's going to be better for her than any drug she can take. And she's doing dramatically better. I just talked to her today. As a matter of fact, she's doing dramatically better. So things like that, when you're always on overdrive, you know, for, my, for me, I saw my stressed out mom with three kids that are running around causing trouble. She's got to be at the, the bank. You got to be at this meeting. You don't have time to prepare your food. That is not a good, that's not going to help you in the long term. So sometimes I'll tell people, hey, get your stress right and come back because you're wasting your money on me. So we get the stress component right. You know, and some people can be just because that's their stress relief. They could vent for an hour, you know, and that's okay. I'll I'll take the money. But the point is you got to fix that underlying problem. If you're in a bad marriage, you got to fix it, right? Or you're in a bad work. You got to sit down and talk to your boss. If you think you're not getting paid enough and you're mad every day, you got to talk about that and address it, either move on or figure it out. But there's a lot of that. that it's, a, it's a tough one because, you know, just like saying, okay, just don't stress anymore and all this stuff's going to get better. Well, that's easier said than done when you have a mortgage to pay and, you know, all these things going on. We've, been, we've all experienced this for the last three years. I think that is a critical key for all of us to say, it's okay to relax a little bit. Go to the beach and look at the sunset. I have a lady today, I saw her, and she's doing dramatically better because she started going for a walk in the beach in bare feet. <laughs> maybe it's the grounding. Maybe it's just being out in the, with the birds. They just released a study recently saying you, you take a 10-minute walk here and there, and it makes a dramatic improvement in your stress hormone. So if we're arguing a low-carb ketogenic diet works by lowering the stress hormones and the cortisol and the insulin levels, then maybe we should be doing other things that we enjoy and laughing more and not being stressed. Like seeing you two, like spending time with you, just seeing you happy and enjoying each other and having fun and you know, going sledding and doing stuff, that is a huge thing. Or having community like we did, you know, having people there and we could sit and talk to them and enjoy each other and have fun with the, the, the keto child people. You know, that's what, what it's about because a lot of people are just isolated, sad, and, and um, depressed and not really enjoying life. So one of my favorite things I'll ask people when they come to me the first time, I'll say, what do you do for fun? And they look at me like, what? Fun? <laughs> like, what's that? Like, they don't even think about it. They don't even know what they do. What would you do if you didn't? Like, where do you get your peace? Yeah. Where do you get your peace? Where do you, do you enjoy painting? Then paint. <laughs> You know, if you like collecting rocks, do that. So a lot of people just don't know. They've been so beaten down for so long that they don't know what they enjoy and what's fun. And they don't have one. You know, I'll ask people because you can sense it. You know, you have people that you coach. Like, when's the last time you laughed about something? When's the last time you found something funny? Like, you're so worried about the macros and the, you know, all this stuff. And that's raising all your stress hormones. So just relax a little bit. Don't weigh yourself 10 times a day, maybe. Try taking a break. If it stresses you out, then don't weigh yourself. If you get happy because you want to know numbers, cool, right? 
we all run into that where we get annoyed and you're stressed every day because you didn't lose 10 pounds. Like, relax. <laughs> Trust the process at some point. Well, this has been an amazing podcast. I, I just said to Rachel, I said, I think that that's another podcast. Just like relax. That could be the title of it. Relax. Well, it's hard to to have, you know, a beginning to that. Like you're yeah. saying, like, and, and Dr. Linskis is giving us some really good ideas for it. And it's very practical, but it it bears more weight when I feel like it's a prescription, yep. right? Like, I'm sorry, but my doctor said I have to take this walk. Yeah. I have to take five minutes. I think that sometimes it's just so precious to have somebody that you trust. It's like a, a doctor say, this is what you need. It's You know you need it. You know you need to deal with the stress. You know you need to have that hard conversation maybe with your boss, or you need to say, hey, I've got to take some time out for my marriage and work on it because it's a daily stressor. And so we've got to do something. But sometimes when it's a doctor that's saying it, you're like, okay, I'm actually going to move forward with this. And are you a doctor that people who are listening to the podcast could reach out to and actually set an appointment with? Yeah, hopefully soon. And, you know, right now I, I am. I'm in, in San Diego, California, but I'm opening a, I'm spreading out a little bit and getting licensed in other states. But right now it's San Diego and, you know, in California and Arizona. So I'm going to start expanding, doing more of this metabolic health stuff in Arizona and California. And, and once I'm in having more time in Arizona, um, then I can get licensed in like 27 other states, which so I could do consults like this, you know, and help people get on track. If their doctor won't order stuff, I'll order it for you, no biggie, and let's get you on track. Let's figure out what we can do. So there's so many good people out there, you know, myself, Tro, Tro Collision, he, he owns half the world, you know, he's doing a lot. And uh, Rob Sive, as, as you talked about, you've consulted with him. There's so many good people out there that uh, are doing great work. So hopefully we can network. So the sad part is there should be no state or really no city that doesn't have a doctor who understands low carb keto or, or at least a metabolic, I would say metabolic health is going to be my focus because it's not all about low carb keto. It's a bigger picture than that. It really is. You could eat a perfect diet, but be stressed and fight with people and be nasty. And then it's just going to be a hard life. So you might as well, if you're going to live longer, you might as well enjoy it while you're here, you know, faith. And that's the other thing, faith. I know you're, you're two of, are, are of faith and um, you know, People laugh at me and they go, you, wow, you believe in this crazy? I go, I have peace in that. I don't have to worry about everything. Like you're worried, but you're stressed and tense all day long. I'm not worried about it. It's like God will control it, right? Yep. I don't know. I can't fix it all. So anyways, things like that, where you know what's in your control and what's not, or, or if you like doing yoga or med, I don't care what you do. It's where you find your peace, ultimately. So before we let you go, Dr. Lenskis, we always have three questions that we like to uh, ask our guests. And so the first one uh, that we always like to ask is when you first got started on keto, was there anything that you were fearful of? The medical board, <laughs> the medical board, really. I was fearful of that because I, I was watching what Gary Fetke and, and Professor Noakes were going through. And that's why I started the Low Carb MD podcast, because I realized talking to all these other doctors and being at some of these, you know, the, the low carb meetings, that they're treating a lot of stuff with lifestyle. So until we make that the standard of care, you cannot change the standard of care until you have a, a force. So if, if, if they came after me, I'd go, look, here's 30 other doctors I personally interviewed and you could hear their story, go see what they're doing. And, and we're having better outcomes. So you, you can't really show better outcomes until you have uh, uh, you know, uh, enough people doing it. If it's just me, they can come after you and shut you down. Like that's what happened to Fetke and Noakes because they were the only ones talking about this stuff. So once you have 300, 3,000, now, now we have thousands of doctors who get it. And they're helping their patients. So it's one of those things we had to, someone had to step up and go, okay, we don't have any doctors talking about this. Then it lends some credibility over time. You know, having Jason Fung on our team, obviously it didn't hurt our credibility. So I think it's that you have to really show that the, the standard of care is not working. And then you have to show there's a better alternative. And that's, that's how medicine should be. We are so thankful that you and so many other doctors are taking that great risk. And, you know, as, as you know, just lay people, we need to support these doctors. We need to be cheering them on. We need to be sharing their journeys, sharing Dr. Linskis's uh, podcast and others, you know, be attending these conferences, listening to their talks and sharing the information that they are uh, providing us with because, you know, we need to back them. We want to see a change um, for patients uh, when it comes to medicine. We need to support these doctors that are taking these really great risks in their career to, to do this a different way. And so we're just so thankful for you. 
Um, another question that we have is, once you started uh, keto, what was your biggest surprise? Probably the biggest surprise and the biggest thing that we took heat for uh, was watching people's mental health improve. You know, I expected the diabetes to get better. I expected certain things to get better. But I remember the first time I had a patient who was scheduled for knee replacement surgery come in and say her knee didn't hurt anymore. After we, we reversed her diabetes and got her off all of her meds, her mood got better. Everything got better. So Tro and I early on, episode 10 and 13 of Low Carb MD, if anyone wants to go back and listen, that was like five years ago now, I think. We were seeing this because this is weird. People are coming in saying they don't feel like smoking and drinking and they're not looking at pornography. That's what really got people fired up because they said food has nothing to do with this. Now we have Chris Palmer and so many others that have come out and go, look, we're, getting, we're seeing benefit. You know, there's definitely benefit. And, you know, seeing diabetics. And so I have people who reverse their diabetes and they, they, they were crying saying, I don't care about the diabetes. I'm laughing again. I'm having fun. I'm introducing myself to my neighbor. And there's no greater thing as a doctor to see someone have a life again and laugh again that wasn't laughing. Depression and anxiety and insomnia, uh, chronic pain, those are all horrible things. So when someone's chronic pain gets better and their inflammation in their brain improves and you see that, you go, wow, this is the way to go. This is That is the biggest reward and the biggest surprise, I think, is the mental health aspects, you know, coming from a family with, with bipolar disorder and depression, anxiety, and all those things, you see that like it's debilitating. The number one cause of disability in the world is depression, anxiety. You know, it's not a knee, knee pain or back pain. It's, it's emotional pain. So yeah, that's a remarkable thing. And I think what that means for our healthcare system is, is unbelievable, but more importantly, what it means for that individual who's struggling with, you know, killing themselves or being depressed every day or not wanting to live uh, to see them smiling again and, and having good life, that is, that's, that's probably the biggest surprise and the most rewarding part about what I do. And that's something that we say to people a lot. And, you know, when we got started on keto, especially for myself, it was just a weight loss thing. I didn't know about all of the health benefits, the mental benefits. I didn't know that it was going to get me off of arthritis medication, which I'd lived on for over 25 years. But I, I, I love to tell people when I'm coaching people, I say, like, if you never lost another pound, while you were eating keto, but you were able to possibly get off of your diabetes medication and you had more energy and you had more mental clarity and you were laughing again and you were enjoying your life again. And, you know, all of these other things happen, even though the scale's not going down, would you be okay with that? And I think sometimes the answer is no, I need to see the scale move. And I always encourage people, I want you to look within and, and find the yes, because the weight loss is nice. But all of those other things allow you to, to live more. No arguments here. If you live a longer life tortured, what good is that? Right? right? If you're miserable all the time, like enjoy your life. At some point, it's just like, hey, let's step back. And, and I think that's the best medicine we can provide people is to say, let's in, enjoy stuff a little bit. Don't take it so serious. Don't worry about every pound. Don't worry about stuff. And so sometimes it's just that perspective. And that's why for me, I like more data points. So I can have someone who's, I have a lady I just saw. She basically, her weight has plateaued for the last six weeks. But guess what? She's lost like uh, a liter of visceral fat and she's put on like, you know, six pounds of muscle and you go, okay, is that again? And she's happy as a dove now when she saw that, but you have to see it and go, look, this, your body's changing and your clothes are falling off. And so, yeah, yeah that's a, that's an important thing is it's not just that we've, we've gotten, so that's, that's one of the frustrations is, is these, these uh, researchers who work with mice and stuff are saying, Hey, look, we give them this many calories. They lose weight. It's all about calories. Like, well, the my, is a mouse going through divorce and stress and has a jerk for a boss and doesn't sleep at night because those things all factor into hunger. And if you, if you give everyone 500 calories a day, they'll lose weight, but will they be happy? And will they be healthier? Yeah. If they're losing muscle mass, are you doing them a favor? So that this is what uh, the researchers don't look and say, what's the lean muscle mass? What's the visceral fat? What's, what's their hormone levels like? And that's the problems we over, complicate stuff and we all also oversimplify and we go just do this and this and you'll be fine well it's just like saying when you're drowning breathe more air and you'll be fine how do you do that when you're drowning yeah. you know anxiety and you know people depressed so you tell them to you know go out and exercise while well, i'm depressed i can't get out of bed how do you or, or i weigh 800 pounds how am i going to exercise you know different things what can you do what can we do can we eat one less cookie a day can we do that and, and there's changes that we can that work for a life that isn't overwhelming and depressing so one final question, and that is when you meet somebody or a patient maybe um, that's first getting started on keto, what is your number one recommendation to them like to get started? Well, you know what, what I would say is that the important thing I, I will say, and Tro and I have figured this out too. I mean, we didn't figure it out, but it's a reality that we both see is that you need to have good family support 
And you have to be able to like be the oddball for a little while. Let people laugh at you and say what you're doing is crazy for a little while until they see the results. Then they'll they'll buy in. But the biggest things that are going to be stress and family support. If you don't have those, your road's going to be a lot harder. So if I have a couple doing it together, they rock it. Because one's going to be weak and the other says, you know what? We shouldn't have cookies. Let's do it next time. And okay. And then the next time the other one's weak and then they say, let's wait. So it's that kind of stuff. And I think just trusting the process going, look, just because you read something on Instagram doesn't mean you're going to lose 40 pounds this week. And I make it very clear to people, you're not, you're not going to have those results, especially if you're a healthy eater. But I love it when someone comes in who eats terrible. Like I have a guy who just came in. He eats, he eats fast food five days a week. He doesn't exercise at all. He drinks soda. And he's like talking. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're my dream patient. You're depressed. you got all these problems. You're motivated now. You have a horrible lifestyle. You're going to show huge results, right? You just have to buy in. But someone who's eating healthy already and exercises seven days a week, they're not going to have quick results. It's going to take a little while for them. You know, so it's, it's one of those things where you go, okay, what will you do and what can you do? And if we can get in your brain and support you every week, we, we get together and talk. We can do great things. But if you're on your own, you go, okay, here, do this and this. Here, take this food list and go eat that. Good luck. It's not going to happen. So that's why we need people like you who can coach. We need nutritionists who say, yes, this isn't crazy. We have cardiologists who get it. That, that's what I mean. When you have a, a, a team approach, we can do great things like what Bert is doing. And so really, it's really having continuity and really saying, hey, look, let's see where we can start. Because the worst thing you can do, I, I, in my opinion, Rob Sivis and I have totally different approaches. And he's right with some people, and I'm right with most people, I would say. He's that saying, <laughs> look, if you set the bar too high, people are not going to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're addicted to alcohol, then you go, you can't drink, obviously. So Rob has more addiction with, with food addiction. But most people may not fit into that category where they have strict food addiction. It could be lifestyle. It could be a lot of other factors. So if you say... Look, day one, you're never going to have pizza again. The rest of your life, you're never going to have sourdough bread. People go, yeah, I'm not doing this. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing this. This is too much. But you go, hey, let's start. And then sooner or later, the patient says, you know, I haven't had sourdough bread in two months. and I really don't care. Okay, great. <laughs> Good. Let's keep doing that. You're on the. So it's hard because sometimes it's such a hard thing because not everyone is addicted and not everyone has to be totally gung-ho. So I have people that I have a lady just now, she, she hadn't had a donut for two years and she had half a donut and she was like, came to me all depressed. I go, look, you had half a donut. Look at the next day. You were perfect. Everything's great. You, you had half a donut. Did you enjoy it? She goes, it wasn't even that good. And my stomach hurt. Good. So then now, you know, you're not going to do that next time. Mm-hmm. So things like that. I think when you come to the conclusion, you know, like, like you're both saying is like, okay, exercise. My doctor's telling me I have to exercise. I have to exercise. If you go, I feel so good. I want to go outside in the sun today. That's different. So a lot of it has to do with attitude and there's studies on that with mice if you force them to exercise, they don't get the benefit as if they want to exercise. So they had mice on two different treadmills and, and one would run and one would have to run. And the one who had to run didn't have the results of the one who felt like running and did it. You know, So I think there's a lot of that in life that you know, how we feel about our attitude, all those things play a role. So that's why I love your positivity because you're medicine for people. Right. Thank you Even though much. you cost me a lot of money because I have new socks because of you, I have a new <laughs> new stuff because we were talking about all kinds of stuff in Utah. And I come home with all that. My wife's like, "What did you? What, did you just go there to shop?" I'm like, "Yeah. Well, I got this thing coming tomorrow, and <laughs> you guys came with keto chow, and we can do this. We have a stuffler now because of you. I saw your video. So my oh. wife was there taking notes. You know. So, anyways, I think it's so much fun because what you're doing is so critical because. On our podcast, we're not talking about recipes. We're not doing the practical stuff you're doing, and that's why it's so great that we could all do our part so I can watch your and go, Oh, I didn't know about Stuffler. I'm going to go and make Stuffler tonight. As a matter of fact. Right. So you start realizing, Oh, that's a good idea. That's a cool way to do it. And, and so it's great that we all have our niches of what we do and it's, it really can help people. So speaking of podcasts, where can people listen to your podcasts? Uh, our podcast is just about everywhere. You know, Spotify we're on. So I have low carb MD, which is the one we talk about mostly lifestyle uh, diet stuff, right? Like keto stuff. Science. We get into the weed sometimes with 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 new research that came out, or talking about artificial sweeteners and the physiology and the you know the latest studies on that. Erythritol happened to be one that that was in the news recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have I have life's best medicine where I talk about all the other stuff because if I talked about faith or hope or other things on low carb MD, people say ah, we don't want to hear about that. We just want to hear about food. Just give us a recipe, right? Life's best medicine. We've had you on for for people who haven't heard, go and listen to their story. It's a fantastic. And when you hear about these life, these testimonies of what, how did someone go from the pit to 
achieve or you know what what matters in life and all this so i have different people from different walks of life that come and tell their story about hopelessness to getting hope or losing 500 pounds or whatever it might be so i love that podcast and so yeah that's my that's life's best medicine and and low carb md are the two places you'll find me don't you love dr linskis i mean he is just such an amazing man and he brings such a calmness to the space right i mean yeah. just a lot of the things that he's talking about, we know. We know that we need to handle our gut biome. We know that we need to reduce stress. We know that it's not just the food that we're eating, but it's all of the other things going on in our life. And that I think that we can look at our day and kind of know what are some inflammatory spikes that are happening. And if we're having this happen over and over again, because we're not willing to rest our bodies, we're not willing to maybe have some hard conversations, you know, and reduce some of our personal commitments, we're going to continue yeah. to be unwell. One of the things I really like about Dr. Lenz, because is he experiments on himself. Yeah. You know, he talks about wearing a CGM, seeing what's going on. Well, he's doing that to himself and yeah. he's, he's analyzing the data on himself to help him become a better medical practitioner for his patients. I love that. So before we do get off, so I, I was going to ask you a question. We've never done this before. Okay. Um, but what was your biggest takeaway from having that conversation with Dr. Lenskis? I would have to say um, our continued discussion about the gut biome and what it does in our body, not just um, when it comes to antibiotics and immunity and, and what it speaks to in that direction. But for somebody like me who has been on a mental health journey for decades, it's very important that I am creating a climate of wellness every single way that I can. And I mean, we've done a lot of our you know due diligence in getting better sleep and reducing our stress in getting movement in and getting sunshine in. But if throwing some kimchi and some yogurt and some sauerkraut down my pie hole will also be building up that gut biome and possibly helping to continue not having inflammation when it comes to anxiety um, and depression, that, that really appeals to me. Yeah. Now, remember, along with throwing down a pie hole, remember what he said about the antibiotics there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we were definitely people that were guilty, especially when it came to the kids, you know, or ourselves. Oh, myself, I used to have to take them every time I had dental work done because I have the pins in my ankle. Well, and I think that for me, I was always like, give me the antibiotic because I want to be over the sickness quickly because I have work demands and I have, you know, to get well really, really quickly not because I want to be well, but because it is an inconvenience for me to be sick. And I can't take the time to recover and to build up my immunity and to just let maybe a cold take its course. course. Yeah. I mean, and more than again, we're not saying like you should never, ever take one. But I think that that was something that we were guilty of. of like, I have a cold. Let's get rid of it. And instead of just like letting our body heal itself, take maybe fasting, laying in bed and recover, right. we tried to force the situation. <laughs> and I think that one of the things that has helped us over the last five or six years is the fact that we've tried to avoid medication, you know, because we're keto, because we know how some of them, not so much about the gut biome, but that a lot of the medications that we were taking, even things like Tylenol and stuff have maltodextrin and we knew how it affected our weight loss. And so we just kind of started weeding out things like cough syrups because there's so much sugar. Yeah. And now we've learned to just let our body heal itself. Now for me, in the same thing that we're, I, the, my biggest takeaway that like was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that with, was with regards to the gut biome was when he said the stress. Mm. And again, we, I've talked about on a lot of our videos, the fact that I think my diet is pretty on point. I mean, on point for what I want. You know, I, I don't go and eat non-keto foods. Yes, occasionally I enjoy a keto treat, you know, once in a while, or I'll have a keto brick or something like that. So for some people, they may say that's not on point. But for me, it's on point and I enjoy the way I'm eating. But the one thing that I have always struggled with, especially since COVID, was stress and sleep. And I I knew that that affected my diet. And it affected my weight loss, 
But it never even occurred to me that not having enough sleep and not having good stress management was also affecting my gut biome, which then affects how I digest my foods and then possibly affects how I'm having weight loss and stuff. So it was really an eye opener here. I'm talking about like, hey, yeah, you know, it's not just feeding the gut biome, but like you also got to manage the stress because you're killing your gut biome with stress. I thought that it was also important for us to talk about some of these quick weight loss hacks. Yeah, that because you're I seeing. have seen that recently. Uh, in fact, in I was recently in a Facebook group. I don't even know if it was our Facebook group. And someone was, and I, I don't want to name medications because I don't want people doing this. So that's right. why I'm not naming. If you've seen anything in the news, you see that there are di- there are diabetes medications that people are now taking to lose weight. And um, it's got some serious consequences. Yeah, and you may lose some weight, but um, I would not be taking it. And I especially would not be utilizing that on a ketogenic way of eating. And you heard him talk about like, what are you doing? You're giving yourself more fat cells. So you may lose weight, but then... When you go off that medication, all of a sudden you're going to start filling up those fat cells and you're going to end up, it's it's going to be another yo-yo diet. So exactly. I think that it's, let's, let's heal our body with our food and stress management and relaxation and movement and sunlight and, and avoid some of the medication. And I think that Dr. Linskis, you know, prescribed time. Yeah. It's going to take some time. I'm, I'm serious. That, that's got to be an upcoming po- a podcast. It, just look for it. Relax. That'll Relax. be the name of it, right? Well, this was a great podcast. I really enjoyed talking to him. I love talking to Dr. Lenskis. Me too. And, and the thing is, is as soon as you see him, he's got that infectious smile. Oh my goodness. He has just got such a, a just an amazing aura around him, right? Yeah. I mean, he just brings so much joy. He's just such a shining light. And I'm excited about uh, really the expansion of his practice. So, But if you are in California, you're in Arizona, you're the lucky person yep. that gets to utilize his services right now. So don't wait. Yeah. Well, that is going to be the end of today's video. Now, if you like seeing videos like this, take a look at some of the videos we have linked right over there. Also, make sure you take a look at most recent video that I'm going to put right over here. But whether you head this way or you head this way, don't forget to head this way. Subscribe to our channel and click the little bell icon. And that way, every single time we talk to somebody amazing, you'll be alerted to it. Until next time. Bye. Bye.